Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We hope everybody is safe and healthy. Welcome to Delos Disputes Tag Time. Mandy, you have to join me. <laughs> joining you, I'm joining you. <laughs> We're delighted you can all join us today. I'm your host, Kabir Dugal. I'm joined by my fabulous co-host, Amanda Lee. Mandy, as she is known, and as you can see, we have perfected our Raising the Roof Delos Disputes tag time. I hope you're all playing along at home as well. <laughs> you, you should. Join the fun. A little bit on tag time. During this webinar series, we have leaders in international arbitration that engage in a substantive discussion on timely topics. After the presentation, you, our audience, will have an opportunity to ask questions to our amazing speaker. And today we have a very special episode. The importance of human rights has probably never been felt greater than in the last few years. Indeed, COVID has affected all of us. And in the United States, the cry for equality is probably reaching a turning point. And for all of us as arbitration practitioners, the query is, how can we use international arbitration to facilitate and promote human rights? In today's webinar, we are going to look at one such initiative, human rights protection in the sea. Mandy will do the honors to introduce our superstar speaker. But let me just share a little anecdote here. As many of you know, I'm interested in building my career as an arbitrator. And one of my mentors advised me, I'm going to give you, and this is what she told me, I'm going to give you one advice. Never do an arbitration as an emergency arbitrator because it will suck every living moment out of you. I share this because our speaker today is actually currently sitting as an emergency arbitrator, but has still taken time to join us. Thank you, Yaz, we are so grateful. And this summarizes why Yaz is such a role model to so many people, including me. I'm also going to share a secret with all of you. Yaz has actually perfected human cloning because there has to be more than one of Yaz to do everything that Yaz does. There is no way one person can do it. Yaz, you have to share your secret with us. Today's episode is co-sponsored by the Asia Pacific Forum for International Arbitration, Arbitral Women, as you all know, our own Mandy is a director there, Careers in International Arbitration. If you're watching this on YouTube, pause, go to LinkedIn. This is a forum created by our own Mandy, you are committing malpractice if you are not a member of this group. So do sign up and the New York International Arbitration Center. We are grateful to all of you for your support. Let me express the, uh, explain the process. After Mandy introduces our fantastic speaker, Yaz will speak to us for around 40 minutes. After that, Mandy and I will facilitate the question and answers. You can ask your question and answers looking at the Q&A function that's available on Zoom. Let me just offer a few best practices for question and answers. This is based on past experience and general good advice. Point number one, a question is a question when it ends with a question mark. If it doesn't have a question mark, it's not a question, it's a sentence. We request you to give us questions. Second, if your question is longer than three lines, it is not a question, it is a paragraph. Now we request you to do this, especially as a favor to Mandy and me, because when we get sometimes very good big questions, it's difficult for us to present it. And we want to maximize how many questions we ask fantastic speakers that we get like, yes. And one final point, we would request you to try and keep your questions relevant to the topic. I know Yaz is an expert on anything to do with international arbitration, but we would urge you to try and make your question relevant to the topic. Yaz, 
We are so, so honored to have you. With that, I turn it over to Mandy to do the honors to introduce Yaz. Mandy, on to you. Thank you very much, Kabir. As always, I have the pleasure of introducing today's fantastic guest. I'm pretty keen to ask her how she perfected the art of human cloning, but I might save that for another time. As is a partner and co-head of the international arbitration practice at Sherman Sterling. She also leads the firm's public international law practice and co-heads the firm's energy practice. Frankly, it's a miracle that she's managed to find time to be here with us today, so we are extremely grateful. She's widely recognized as one of the most prominent international arbitration and public international law specialists around the world. She's a vice president of the ICC International Court of Arbitration, a member of the LCIA court, and a member of the SIAC Court of Arbitration. She's also a member of the ICSID panel of arbitrators, appointed by the chairman of ICSID's administrative council. Yaz teaches at Harvard Law School, Yale Law School, and Pantheon Sorbonne University. In the summer of 2019, she gave a course at the Hague Academy of International Law on the powers of the arbitrator. She conducts research in the areas of public international law and international arbitration, and she's authored new and regularly speaks about both these fields. Now, our regular viewers will recall that Yaz was tagged by Meg Kinnear, who appeared on episode four of Tag Time. We're delighted to have her here today. And so, without further ado, Yaz, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kabir, for your very kind words. Um, thank you, Mandy. It's truly a pleasure to be uh, on this webinar. And thank you for having given me an opportunity to address this very important initiative. We're extremely proud of being working on this with Human Rights at Sea. I will tell you a few words uh, in terms of introduction. And Mandy, if you would be kind enough to move um, to show my slides and move directly perhaps to slide four, uh, which is the introduction to my, um, to my presentation. And, uh, and as to cloning, I think that today is the main me. <laughs> so I don't know which of the clones you will have seen in other circumstances, but today it's the real me, passionate about human rights and arbitration. So um, thank you, Mandy. So I'll, I'll, I'll just start. Um, there are three points I want to make about, first of all, human rights and international arbitration. It's not every day that you hear about the interplay between the two. And then I will say a few words about the framework of the project that we're working on with Human Rights at Sea and the white paper that has been published. And then I will address the, the substance of, of our project. So moving on to the next slide um, as to the interplay between arbitration and human rights. You don't hear that often, and Kabir, you mentioned that earlier, you don't hear that often. It started maybe a few years ago, the interplay between human rights and arbitration, essentially in the context of investment treaty arbitration. And essentially to hear about criticism as to how the investment protection regime um, limits somehow the protection of human rights. Um, for example, the limitation of the right to water, the right to health, the right to self-environment. You would hear that from NGOs, from indigenous communities, from um, in certain literature. So that, that is the type of criticism that you hear about how the investment protection regime is not advancing human rights. I think, and that's my personal view, of course, I think that a number of these criticisms are based on misperceptions about what the international investment treaty regime is. And I've, I've flagged on screen three of these criticisms. One is the perceived chilling effect of the exercise by states of their regulatory power. You hear a lot about this. This would warrant a sole webinar in its own. It's a very important topic. The second criticism is that third parties that are affected, most um, importantly the indigenous communities in relation to environment, for example, are not party to the dispute. However, the system has found ways of allowing them to intervene in the process as amici, as friends of the court. So these criticisms have been addressed by the system, and that's why I say um, also these are sometimes mis misperceptions. And finally, the perceived lack of transparency, and that um, has given rise to what you know all about the reform that is currently at play and being discussed at UNCITROL Working Group 3 on the reform of investment 
treaty arbitration, ISDS, investor state dispute um, mechanism. And of course, as a result of that, a lot of these criticisms will be addressed and solutions will be found. But more importantly, and uh, moving to my next slide, Mandy, I think that what is important to bear in mind is that there is no intrinsic incompatibility between international arbitration and human rights. Not far from being an impediment to the development of human rights, I believe truly that arbitration can be a powerful tool to strengthen and advance the protection of human rights and more broadly, the rule of law. You will have seen that in the protection of aliens and foreign national, and that was the work of international arbitration for um, a century, starting the early 20th century uh, onwards. And the benefit of arbitration there is that it is accessible, it has a bespoke nature, and therefore it can enhance access to justice and accountability, especially when it gives a voice to the affected parties. And this is the real benefit of arbitration. So if you bring the two together and you look at abuses of human rights, the fact that the victims do not have a voice and that you can find a tool that gives them access to justice, then you can um, really enhance access to justice and the uh, development of the rule of law. So specifically, and this is what I'm going to address today, is how arbitration can be used to improve the scope of human rights protection in the maritime environment. And for this, we have worked with Human Rights at Sea, which is a charity in the UK. They have worked and they have been working on this for years and they have characterized this situation as a black hole. And on screen, you have a reference to the, 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 the publications on the topic, uh, including in the European Journal of International Law as to what this black hole is. And this is really the focus of our work with the human rights at sea. Yeah. So next slide, I wanted to give a sense to all of you as to what this black hole is and why we speak of a black hole. So 90% of the world trade is shipped at sea. This in itself gives you an idea of the worldwide trade and what we're looking at. The fishing industry employs over 50 million people globally. Again, you just see the mass and the scale. Seas cover 71% of the Earth's surface. And if you look at the high seas only, this counts for approximately 64% of the ocean surface. So this in itself shows you how much trade is ongoing in this space and how much human rights violations can be a true issue, especially in the high seas, where there's a uh, concurrence of jurisdiction of different states, and I will come back to that. What we're looking at here, and just a few examples of the type of human rights abuses that occur repeatedly and with impunity, and here again, I would like to pay tribute to the work of the International Labour Organization, Human Rights Watch, UNHCR, HCR, and of course, Human Rights at Sea. So you have a few examples on, on screen. The highly exploitative working conditions on fishing fleets, shipping vessels, and cargo ships. We're talking about modern slavery. We're talking about dangerous working conditions, passports being withheld, wages being denied, forced labor. We're also talking about physical violence and degrading and inhuman treatment. We're talking about human trafficking. And we're also talking about non-assistant to distressed ships and refusal of entry to refugees and asylum seekers. So you see the expansive nature of the human rights violations in the sea and really the urgency of addressing this issue. On the next slide, I want to uh, essentially pay tribute to how this all came about and how we got on board on this fascinating and wonderful project. So as I said, in 2014, Human Rights at Sea started working on this issue to support the awareness because a lot of the times the question of awareness, to raise awareness and work on the implementation and accountability of human rights protection in the modern environment. And I would like to pay specific tribute to David Hammond, who's the founder and CEO of Human Rights at Sea. He came up with the idea and he told us that he first considered the possibility of using arbitration in his own private marine environment at his shower. That's how he came about with the idea of why not use arbitration to safeguard um, uh, human rights at sea. And that's about the time when um, we approached and more importantly, my colleague and friend Alex Markopoulos approached 
at David Hammond to explore ways in which we could assist as arbitration council. Um, Alex has a background in shipping and, and maritime law, and that's one of his multiple hats. Um, that's completely in line with what we do at the firm in terms of public international and, hum and uh, uh, the law of the sea. And that's also consistent with the, with the great work that we do on pro bono initiatives. And so this completely makes sense for us to get engaged on and involved in. And so we, uh, we uh, met with David Hammond and the relationship was created and we started working based on the de dedicated work of the Human Rights at Sea charity and our own experience and expertise in public international and international arbitration. Um, on the next slide, I do want to show who they are. So you will see uh, the teams that have been working on this marvelous um, project. First, you will have, as soon as you have the slide, you will have the Human Rights at Sea team. This is a small team, so we have to uh, really be thankful to them for the wonderful work that they do. This is David Hammond, as you see on the left, and Elizabeth Mavropoulou, um, who's a trustee, and also we work with her as well. And on the bottom, you see the full Sherman and Sterling team that has worked on this, um, on this project. Alex Markopoulos, I, I mentioned him. Um, he has worked with Ellis Edson, um, who's Australian. Alex is American and Greek. Um, Ellis is Australian. Sandrine Antovi is Canadian um, with Romanian origins. And, and I would like to also thank Sandrine because she helped me put up, with, put up these slides and prepare for this uh, presentation. So thank you, Sandrine. And Masha Tsarova, who's uh, one of our Ukrainian colleagues. And, uh, and all of them have worked on this uh, great project and initiative. And I will say a few words about that right now. And so that has resulted in what we call the white paper. Um, a few words on the white paper, which you find on the website of Human Rights at Sea in both English and French. We have a French translation at this time and hopefully we'll have more languages as well. So the goal of the white paper is to establish a conceptual framework for an arbitration based system providing the victims of human rights abuses of an effective remedy. Um, and the work that we've done is really to start an analysis and conceive concrete steps to create and implement the system. So this is all contained in the white paper. In the white paper, we also look at the main obstacles that currently prevent victims um, from accessing effective remedy. Um, we also assess how international arbitration can be be an effective remedy and provide uh, more effective mechanisms for redress to victims. And also we have made a number of recommendations um, on the features that this arbitration mechanism can have. The next steps are going to be really based on this white paper um, to talk to the stakeholders, to really um, circulate this within the international legal community and have a real discussion about this innovation and how we can build this. And also in terms of next step, we'll have the drafting of core documents such as draft arbitration agreements, offers of consent, draft arbitral rules, et cetera, and that will be forthcoming. So with that, um, uh, and I just want to go to my first part of the presentation, Mandy, if we can go to slide 12. And here I would like to address the main challenges today that impede the protection of human rights at sea. And we've counted about four of them. The first challenge, slide 13, is the obstacles to the number of states that can police compliance with human rights at sea um, based on the type of jurisdiction that they have. And here you have really the competition in a way between different states, even though they may have jurisdiction, they don't always exercise it. So I'll, I'll be fast on this one. You have the flat state, of course, um, that's the state having jurisdiction over the vessel itself. You do have a number of flag of convenience. This is a number of states, Panama, Liberia, and Marshall Islands, which uh, give their flag more easily and are more lenient on the registries. So this is the flag state. It has jurisdiction over the vessel. Then you have the coastal state, which has jurisdiction over the territorial sea, the contiguous zone, and to some extent in certain circumstances also over the exclusive economic zone. And again, this is uh, in terms of nautical miles, this will be different in terms of what, what state you're looking at and so forth. 
the port state as well, that will be the state uh, whose ports ships will be using to um, dock, to load or discharge passengers and cargoes. And finally, but importantly, I want to also uh, re refer to universal jurisdiction, and that under international laws, the possibility offered to the court of every state to prosecute um, uh, very serious violations of human rights. And in terms of piracy, that universal jurisdiction would exist in a number of states that recognize it. So taking an example, and here to the next slide, uh, please, Mandy, that I have taken the, uh, the illustration that you would find on the, on the website of Human Rights at Sea, with a number of scenarios just to show the difficulty and the complexity of the situation. And here, to be fast, and again, I would refer you to Human Rights at Sea and their great website, You'd see, for example, the route of a vessel that goes from, uh, Rotter from Shanghai to Rotterdam. And you see, in this example, the number of crew members, the nationalities that are involved, the, um, the nationalities of the armed guards. Um, so you have a number of nationalities. You have the ships um, uh, going to uh, uh, the high seas quite often. On this route, you can see that. And you also have the ship being often outside the territory of some of these nationalities that you see for the crew and the armed guards. On the next slide, you see still um, the same uh, example, but you see the great distances that are traversed during this journey. And that really make it difficult to police uh, the abuses of human rights over this journey. And if you add to that the fact that black states do not necessarily maintain uh, important patrol, sea patrol capacity, and just to take the example of Marshall Islands, you see that's the third most black state in, in 2019 with over 4,700 registered vessels, but they have a very limited sea patrol capacity. So even though they will have a lot of vessels registered under uh, uh, the Marshall Islands, the actual uh, policing at sea will be limited because of that limited capacity. So you have all of these states having jurisdiction, but not necessarily exercising that or having the ability to exercise that jurisdiction. That was the first type of obstacle, the, 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 the jurisdiction of the state. The second type, uh, moving on to slide 16, are the practical barriers for the victims to have access to adjudicative fora. And this is really the, some of the barriers we're talking about. So, for example, for a victim of human rights to identify the domestic court that had jurisdiction, uh, that in itself is extremely complex. And sometimes states will not accept necessarily extraterritorial human rights um, uh, jurisdiction. Some states, for example, will be receptive to forum non convenience and will decline jurisdiction. In this regard, I wanted to slide um, the uh, Canadian example. And here you see on my slide, on your A third bullet, you see the example of Canada. The Supreme Court has recently ruled that companies could be sued in Canada for human rights abuses abroad on the basis that customary international law forms part of Canadian common law. That I find wonderful. So that would be one uh, ground for jurisdiction in Canada in that relation but it's not the case for all jurisdictions. So again, it's the, the victim will have to find the right jurisdiction where to uh, bring its claim, his, his or her claim. The second type of barrier for the victims is the geographical distance between the victim and the domestic court having jurisdiction. And I don't wanna, don't wanna expand on that. I refer you back to the example that we used earlier. The foreign legal system, it can come with a lot of complex procedural mechanisms on notifying claims, time bars, rules of evidence, and these are not readily accessible to a victim of human rights. Next slide, language. You, we have to be, of course, you know, adamant to the fact that these uh, victims of uh, abuse of human rights may be um, seamen uh, who don't speak the language of the country where the abuse occurs. For example, here, I took just the example of Rotterdam port. The Dutch port would have jurisdiction, but if you have a Filipino claimant who speaks only Tagalog, then uh, it's very difficult to have access to the Dutch courts. So language is also a very important practical barrier. Next, um, the human rights bodies internationally also have procedural hurdles. So quite often you will have to have exhausted local remedies in order to have access to an international um, court of human rights. 
and there's not only uh, there is always uh, ne the necessary awareness about this and lack of funds finally that's also a very important practical barrier the costs are onerous you have legal representation court fees travel fees translation fees and of course you also have the, the the cost that you have to incur in order to even know if you have a claim in the first place so these are the barriers practically that victims uh, face and one of the reasons why they may not bring the claim they're not aware and with all of the difficulties and hurdles they they may just give up and and not do anything the next obstacle is the lack of uh, or the the weak system of enforcement mechanism that we have internationally let's face it so we took the example of panama and that's next slide mandy next slide 19 the example of Panama, uh, which is uh, one of the flags of convenience, in 2019, according to Lloyd's List, Panama had registered over 9,300 vessels. So it, this gives you an example of number of vessels on the Panamian flag. Panama has ratified the American Convention on Human Rights. It has accepted the jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. Judgments of the courts are binding, of course, but the enforcement quite often will be dependent on the will of the state itself. So in terms of e efficiency of the enforcement, you're not always looking at the most effective way. And the figure that is important to bear in mind is that with those over 9,000 registered vessels, Panama accounting for about 17% of the world's registered vessels. You, so, you see that there's not a single case registered against Panama at, before the Inter-American Human Rights. Not that Panama is breaching human rights violations, that's not, that's not my point. My point is that Panama as the state um, of the flag could uh, be uh, facing some type of uh, proceedings, but this has never happened. And it may still only be a question of awareness and accessibility of the fora. And that in itself is also telling. So moving from, moving on from the challenges to the protection of human rights at sea, um, I am going to my next point uh, on slide 21, uh, please, Mandy. That is how arbitration can help. And this is really where we have tried to be innovative with David Hammond and his team at Human Rights at Sea and, and my own team at Truman and Sterling. So six points I want to make here about arbitration. On slide 22, the most important concept, I think, is the fact that the system we're proposing is victim-centered and it gives the victim a direct right of action against the state, against the company or the person that's alleged to bear responsibility for the misconduct or abuse. This is not new. Again, I will make the analogy of investment arbitration. Those of you who know the, the system, this already existed. How many of us remember that in 1965, when the exit convention was signed, this was a revolution in international law and in, in arbitration, because for the first time, of course, you had the contractual arbitration mechanism, but for the first time, you had an institution, an arbitral institution established that allows um, a right, direct right of access to uh, victims of violations of contracts and later on laws and treaties. And here I've reproduced a preamble to the 1965 it's the convention you see that you know it's recognizing that national legal processes exist but international methods may be appropriate in certain cases this is exactly what we have here jurisdiction nationally may exist but it's not efficient or as efficient as we want it to be and so international um, uh, methods may be more appropriate to the type of abuses we're talking about and this is what exit has done and I wanted also to pay tribute to Sir Lauterpacht. And at the time, this I think it's the um, introduction to Professor Scheuer's book on the Exit Convention. And he acknowledges for the first time a system was instituted under which non state entities, corporations, or individuals could sue states directly. So this is, it's not long ago, 1965. So it's the same that we're looking at for human rights. It's really victim centered, direct right of action to the victims. That's the first point. The second point, my next slide, um, allow accessibility. That's what arbitration does. So because arbitration can be 
simple, it can increase accessibility to justice. So we can have a system where we have a uniform streamlined procedural structure and therefore we can avoid the complex idiosyncratic rules of domestic civil procedure in the different countries. We can have a single cross-border arbitration system again that will make communication easier and that will be offered widely internationally to everyone. The adaptability of arbitration also increases its accessibility and here we can devise procedural rules that are tailored to the needs of human rights victims. We can have something that's quick, effective and low cost. Um, we can have something that takes into account the language of the victim, um, something that takes into account the long distances. Do you remember I said that that was an obstacle, accessible places for, and, and here we can have institutions, up to institutions hand in hand working for this goal. And with the COVID-19 situation, we all saw that virtual hearings um, and virtual meetings are the new day. So this is something that can also be used in uh, virtual, in uh, human rights abuses. So we don't have any limits, right? So this can be tailored to the needs of the, uh, of what we want to, 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 to do for these abuses. Um, and then we can have a centralized system um, and a centralized arbitration-based system which will allow, and I will come back to that, uh, more attractive financial support and pro bono legal services for those who are in need. So that is the adaptability, flexibility, and accessibility of arbitration. And that was my second point. My third point, and that's a very important point, of course, when we talk about the benefits of arbitration, of course, it's the neutrality and independence and impartiality of the adjudicators, right? So, um, arbitration allows to have independent, impartial uh, arbitrators in relation to both parties. And here I'm slide 34, I'm sorry, Mandy. And, and importantly, uh, also offer equal power to both parties in the constitution of the tribunal uh, to the extent that it will be panel. But again, these all need to be determined later on. Still talking about arbitrators, next slide they can be specialized and this is also very important um, uh, you can have specialized arbitrators in human rights in maritime law in labor law in any relevant uh, field of national law that can help improve the system and interestingly after the white paper was published um, we received a number of expressions of interest from potential arbitrators um, and, and there is a will out there for, for and, and these are arbitrators who have maritime and human rights um, expertise who would be willing to act. On my next slide, um, the other benefit of arbitration is also that is it incentivizes um, the rule of law and it sort of sheds the light on the perpetrators. And this is really important. What you see today when we talk about awareness and lack of awareness, it allows human rights abuses to continue with impunity and nobody sanctioned for it. And if we have a system that's worldwide centralized and that allows the victims to um, report those violations, we can at the same time have something that has a deterrent effect on the potential uh, abusers and also makes the states and the international community aware of the patterns of violation that exist and for them to find ways to deploy enforcement and inspection resources more effective where those are needed. So by putting the light on the perpetrators and the patterns through arbitration, we also are achieving the uh, advancement of the rule of law. Last but not least, and that's my next two slides, enforcement. And I started with that. The enforcement is sometimes weak and or lacking simply. Um, now we can think of a system and this is all out in the open and that will be the discussion that Human Rights at Sea will have. So I wanted to fly to New Convention and um, everybody need to have in mind the commercial declaration um, under Article 1.3 of the Convention of course, that's the, um, uh, the commerciality um, exception and I have put on screen that these are the differences um, arising out of legal relationship, whether contractual or not, which are considered as commercial under the national of that state. In some uh, jurisdictions, this has been interpreted widely, um, including contracts for shipments of goods. 
but one thing to consider will be um, going forward to include in, in relevant contracts and uh, a concept that the uh, relationship will be deemed commercial for purposes of the New York Convention. So, so that the New York Convention can be accessible for purposes of the enforcement of awards in this, um, in this uh, space. And the next slide, I just wanted to flag for those who are interested in the New York Convention to have a look at the Uncitral Secretariat's Guide um, on New York Convention 1958.org. You will have, on, uh, in relation to Article 1.3, you will have the full explanation of the guide on Article 1.3 and the relevant jurisdiction worldwide on, on that as well. And we also have been assisting with Uncitral on this project. This is another of our pro bono projects. If I may just point out, Yaz gets full credit for having done everything for this project. Yaz, you are a machine. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. I'm not on my own. I have a wonderful team behind me, so I, 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 I will. And you have to check the website, by the way. Their name is on the website. I do want to say Benjamin Sino and Pierre Vigier are wonderful and two of my best teams on that. My third and final part, I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, and this is really to finish up on the challenges of an arbitration-based system and the potential solutions. And this is, again, looking forward and looking ahead. Um, if, Mandy, if you don't mind going to slide 31, and I will say a few words on, uh, on, on each of these uh, challenges. The first one is really engaging the stakeholders to provide consent. Arbitration, of course, is based on consent. We have to ensure that consent exists. There's ways of achieving that. So states, of course, you know, can uh, give consent to arbitrate human rights at sea disputes in their legislation or in international instruments. That's their privilege and their prerogative. And that's something that we want to work with states. Businesses can consent to arbitrate employment contracts with seafarers and other employees and contractors, and they can include arbitration in their contracts. And that's where, for example, you would have the commercial exception for the New York Convention. States can also require, and this is important, states can require businesses to agree to arbitrate human rights at sea disputes as a condition for the registration of ships or docking at their ports. And these are, we're talking about the flag um, states and the port states. So in order to exercise their jurisdiction, they can ask companies and, uh, and uh, businesses to agree to arbitration. And this is one of the ways of expanding consent. Some other innovative solutions that we have thought of and that we will be looking at, carrots and sticks. And this is um, uh, in particular true in the financial sector. And um, so for the financial sector to offer um, favorable finance, financing terms to companies when they agree to offer consent to arbitration in their contracts. And again, this is something that will need to be discussed with the financial institutions and another type of innovative solution would be to, and again, this is not unknown to those who know uh, investment treaty arbitration is the third party beneficiary clause and to include open offer to arbitrate for third parties um, in contracts. This is really important because this would allow uh, seafarers who, have, who are undocumented, um, those who don't have a formal contract of employment to benefit from the system and to benefit for, from the offer to arbitrate even when they have not themselves been engaged in that and for them to uh, be able to bring uh, their claims if there is a situation of abuse. So this is the first point on consent. The second point, and this is also extremely important, the work that can be done with arbitral institutions. And by the way, also when the, uh, when the and, and that's my next slide, Mandy, apologies. When the white paper was published, once again, a number of institutions expressed their, their um, willingness to, be, to come on board and work on this great initiative. Why? Because ad hoc arbitration, which is of course a possibility, can have a higher management burden on the parties, especially when you're facing an, un, an unsophisticated party would not know um, anything about so, um, procedural issues. And so an institutional management will allow to, to go beyond that uh, type of hurdle. So what an institution can bring is know-how, of course, with uh, arbitrary recommendations, 
procedural rules, independent um, storage of sensitive information of evidence, and management system of protection of identities, and that can be very important in the case of individuals who, who have been abused. Um, institutions can also engage into discussions with stakeholders because they have their own network and they have and they have the task force and they engage in this type of legal improvement and advancement of, of, uh, of the rule of law as well. And finally, institutions can also collect funds um, for human rights and assist with the cost of the, uh, of the, 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 the process. And that's my last slide. Mandy, if you can please go to slide 33. And that's really to recognize that the costs are an issue. So in a national setting, you would have, of course, the legal fees, translation fees, travel, witnesses. In arbitration, would add to that the tribunal fees and institutional costs. So that's not readily available to a victim of human rights abuse, right? A seafarer who, who, who would want to bring a claim. So what is important is to address that right away and to set up mechanisms to, to help and help victims of human rights violations. And a number of uh, solutions here that are just uh, offered for, uh, for your thought. A, set a special purpose fund to cover the legal fees and costs. These could be fueled by the state's and maritime employer contributions, by charity contributions and donations, and institutions can play a role here to uh, manage the fund and uh, allow the distribution of the fund to the victims when they, they need that. Legal aid is another uh, possibility, and finally, of course, pro bono services at discounted fees. Um, so all of these are on the table, will be uh, discussed in the next weeks and months, with human rights at sea, um, with our assistance, and of course, everyone in the legal community who has an interest for this important and really essential um, uh, topic, uh, the advancement of the rule of law at sea, and really offering a redress, effective redress to the victims. My very last slide, Mandy, if you don't mind, would be to show that this is, in a way, my, my, my presentation today could be a teaser to the real webinar, which will be on the 24th of June. Um, uh, please register. That will be uh, starting at 3 p.m. CET. That is with Human Rights at Sea. David Hammond will be uh, speaking, will be talking about his ideas and how, how you know, his, his uh, views and concepts and vision. And we will have Professor Gaillard talk about consent in arbitration in this space. We'll have Alex Markopoulos who will also address um, these so um, a very rich program um, and again I want to refer all of you to that webinar on the 24th of June and that was my last slide and just finishing up by really thanking you for giving me the platform to talk about this very very important initiative again um, we can do a lot all hand in hand and I hope that we will um, all progress this fast and effectively thank you Kibri thank you Mandy Thank you so much, Yaz. This is, this is really fantastic. What a great presentation. What a great initiative. Uh, bravo, or as the more common phrase has become today, huzzah. <laughs> uh, it really shows, I think, how collaboration and working together can really make a difference. And so we commend everybody who's involved in this project, your partners, your team, it really gives a lot of hope at a very distressing time. So very well done. We offer you, Mandy and I offer you a clap on behalf of everybody. Keep it up. We are very, very honored to have you all be a part of our community, the arbitration community. Yes, we are flooded with questions. <laughs> this, is, this is the problem when you have an innovative, topic that touches everybody in a very meaningful way. And, you know, this is the problem for us now to try and find the appropriate questions. So we apologize in advance uh, if we cannot get through your questions, but, but we really appreciate them. A couple of people have posed questions on transparency, and I'll just pick up one as a representation for every, all the related questions, you know. Uh, as, as you know, yeah, as you know, arbitration is generally perceived as being private. You know, our, our value that we put is on confidentiality. If we contrast that with human rights, right? 
the general approach is, you know, you want to benefit from spotlighting the issue, right? You want to highlight the violation that is seen as building in a national jurisprudence. And therefore the query is, how is this fantastic initiative looking at these two conflicting values when it comes to transparency? I think that the default rule, just in the same way as we have come about it in investment treaty arbitration is transparency. We have to have a system that is transparent. We have to have a system, and, and that's the only way where we can avoid the perpetrators to continue their abuses, right? So, and that's the only way that we can shed light on, on you know, companies and, and um, states and, and whoever um, commits those abuses. So I think that there, there's two things here that we need to keep in mind. One, transparency, I think, should be the default rule. At the same time, because we're talking about individuals and sometimes weak, in a weak position individuals, we have to find a way where individuals have the option of preserving their identity or preserving any sensitive information that concerns um, them personally, um, so, so as to preserve the integrity of that person. So I think that the, the balance to me is really between these two, to be fully transparent, to, as you say very rightly, and I, that's, that's very dear to my heart, the building of a jurisprudence of arbitral awards, which to me is true in investment arbitration, is true in commercial arbitration, and all the more in human rights abuses and how arbitration can help. So, so having a, a, a case law, having a true jurisprudence, and at the same time, shedding the light on the perpetrator, but at the same time, preserve the identity and the integrity of the victims to the extent that this is something they would like to do. And I think that one of the points that I think I didn't make, but I think is important to make is that this system is victim-centered. Therefore, a lot of these options should be in the hands of the victim. So the victim should have the option of how transparent they want it to be and how they want the system to protect them individually. Fantastic, thank you, Yaz. Clearly nothing slips the eyes of Yaz. <laughs> you have, that, that, this is fantastic. You know, the victim-centered approach, it's really, it's really- It's the exactly, only way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it exactly. Is the only way. Mandy, I'll pass it to you to ask the next question. Thank you very much, Kabir. Yes, you've, you've talked a lot today about a number of the challenges that you've been trying to overcome in, um, in getting this, this exciting initiative off the ground. One of those challenges is perhaps the issue of consent. What incentive would corporations have to consent to the arbitration of human rights at sea disputes? I believe that human rights can be advanced through publicity. Right, so the public image of businesses, and this is what we see in the CSR world and in the ESG world, this, the public image will be very important. And one of the reasons why businesses may want to enter into this system is to, is to look good, simply, to have a public image that is consistent with compliance with the rule of law. When I talked about the financing of the system, to the extent that financial institutions, and by the way, the webinar of the 24th June will also have a representative of financial institution, and that will be very important to discuss then. I think that the financial institutions with the carrots and sticks uh, mechanism can be an incentive for businesses if they say, for example, that they offer favorable financing terms to businesses, that in itself can be an incentive, of course, for businesses to engage and to accept the consent to arbitration. And if you think also to, about the fact that to the extent that there will be a mechanism to um, bring a claim against um, a, a, a state or a business, a corporation, um, a ship owner and so forth, arbitration can be speedier, can be faster, and that in itself also the benefits of arbitration can also benefit in terms of just the dispute resolution mechanism in comparison with the national system can in itself be also a, an incentive for, for businesses to engage. So um, with all this, I, I think that um, businesses can find good reasons to engage and, and give consent, especially when we talk about contracts and employment and so forth. So. 
That's great to hear. Thank you very much. Yes, I'm going to hand it over to Kabir now for the last question because I'm conscious that you've got to go. You've got to go and yeah. check on the plugs. You know, you've got to make sure that they're making progress in your absence. <laughs> Uh, yes, we are very, very grateful with your indulgence. We'll ask you one final question just to our audience, right? We're getting a lot of requests for the white paper and you will all get the white paper, you know, over the weekend. Once we also upload today's excellent webinar on YouTube, we will send you the white paper. So stay tuned. We will urge you to read it because it is absolutely fantastic. Uh, yes. I think this question is interesting and it caught my attention and you will see why. Uh, you know, we have seen a lot of discussion and perhaps condemnation is the appropriate word here in the United States, which is why I asked this question, you know, of the so-called mandatory arbitration, right? This is the practice of providing an employment contracts, something to the effect that a wide array of disputes between employers and employees must be resolved through arbitration, often in distant locations, right? And at least critics will tell you that this is a tool for dissuading employees from bringing cases, you're putting a lid on these claims, you're seeking to reduce damages, you're trying to prevent class actions. You know, these are some of the arguments that we see globally and definitely in the United States. And you know, want to see how does your proposal try to address these concerns? If you've had any reactions, any suggestions, thoughts? Thank you, Kabir. The, the, the answer and the short answer is again, victim-based, victim-centered. Everything is within the hands of the victim in, in this system that we have uh, come, come with. The victim will have the choice. So we can make it non-exclusive. So the victim will always have the option and the ability to go to the jurisdiction, the courts of whatever state that has jurisdiction. But to the extent that it can, the, the victim can also benefit from an arbitration clause, that victim will have that option. So by giving the option to the victim, it's not mandatory. It's really an option. It's the freedom and the victim having access to both, the victim decides which way he, want, he, he or she wants to go. So, so again, by, by really looking and focusing on the victim, I think that we find the answer to most of our, our questions and obstacles. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, we will not have difficulty um, establishing some of these mechanisms, but um, the, the, the philosophy is really to look at the victim and how we can go about making things easy for the victim. So no mandatory arbitration, it's, it's optional. Giving choice is always a wonderful thing in life, right? So, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. With that, I'll pass it on to Mandy. Thank you very much, Kabir. Yes, thank you so much for taking the time to join us on Tag Time today and to provide us with a really interesting presentation on this cutting edge topic. No one can say that we at Tag Time are not right at the forefront of topical issues in international arbitration and international human rights law. So, as our audience will know, our show is called Tag Time for a reason. At the end of each episode, our speaker has the opportunity to tag their successor in the hot seat and to choose who we will be hearing from in a future episode. So, yes, who will you be tagging today? I am tagging Professor Diane Desierto. She's a professor um, in Notre Dame in, in the US. She's also a Philippine uh, national. So she masters the, the system in Asia, in the Philippines, and she really has the Asian look on things. And at the same time, she, she's, you know, she was um, educated in the US at the vet schools, yellow school, and, uh, and she really has a very original and uh, uh, also innovative look at things. So Diane will look at the substantive procedural and evidentiary challenges in involving, in invoking, sorry, climate change, environmental law, and human rights in arbitrations involving infrastructure and energy development projects. So a very nice bridge between my presentation today and the next tag time. Absolutely, thank you very much for a really interesting tag. We look forward to featuring Professor Desierto on tag time in two weeks time. So please do be sure to tune in on June 17th for that episode.
Now, in the meantime, please join Neil Kaplan and his MC, Shan Bao, tomorrow at 9 a.m. London time. It will be worth getting up, we promise, for the latest episode of Delos's In Conversation with Neil webinar series. Neil will be speaking to leading arbitrator Sir Bernard Briggs, and you can register for your free place at that webinar on Delos's website, one not to be missed. So thank you all for taking the time to join us today. You will be receiving an email over the coming days. It will include details of the white paper, as Kabir has said, and you will also receive a link in due course to a video of this fascinating webinar. So we look forward to welcoming you all back next time when our guest will be Cecilia Azar. So until then, thank you all very much for listening. Thank you once again to Yaz, and please thank stay you. everyone. And I shall now hand over to Kabir to say his goodbye. Thank you all. We were very delighted you could join us. Yes, we sincerely thank you. We know how busy your time is. We know how many initiatives you are involved with. You have taken the time. You've probably shared this cutting edge topic with us before the official webinar. And we are so, so <laughs> grateful. Thank you, Yes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Kabir. Thank you, Mandy. It was wonderful having you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.